love to just get yeah. into it. So Spencer, I just want to say thanks so much for joining us today. You're our first guest. That's not a, you know, just mainly a Kendama player and <laughs> to have you on uh, as the first one and have such a, as a, the, as the amazing person and a highly accomplished juggler that you are, we really appreciate your time and thank you so much. So it's a pleasure to have you on. Absolutely. No, I wouldn't, I would not say no to this. No. <laughs> <laughs> no it's, we're, I've, we have a lot to talk about today. I'm really excited to, to dig in. Um, but our audience is mainly canal players. So it's not all awesome. of them may be familiar with the, with the juggling scene. And so can you please give us an intro of just basically and for like who you are, your age, where you're from and how long you've been juggling? Yeah. Um, so my name's Spencer um, and I've been juggling for 15 years. Uh, I've uh, I started in like the hobbyist juggling scene for the most part um, and really delved into like more sport, super technical, difficult trick juggling and. Um, and uh, so I man managed to do w win three different competitions with the World Juggling Federation, which is like a sport based juggling competition. Um, so I, I started doing that a ton. Uh, but then when I graduated high school, I started college and I was working at Chipotle for a little bit. I realized like, OK, I can I can risk it and try to juggle professionally. Um, because it's what I've put so much of my life into and it's what I'm really passionate about. So, um, yeah, for the past three or four years, I've been doing it professionally and it's been going pretty well. I uh, did my first circus tour last year with Flint Creek Circus uh, on the West Coast, so like Northern California and Oregon. And then this year I did um, Hideaway Circus uh, that was like down the East Coast. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, now I'm more into like performing juggling, um, and it's been a blast. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing. So, okay. So you just mentioned you've been a professional juggler for, you said three years, right? Past three years, three or four years. I mean, like full time. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I've always done shows here and there, like, like I've done like little, like routines that I've performed for random mm -hmm. gigs sometimes, but like, yeah, full time is my only source of income. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah around that. That's okay. Cool. And, and so yeah, past juggling professionally for the past three years. And I was going to say, I mean, it kind of sounds like you just said right there. I was going to ask what constitutes a, you've been doing it professionally because I mean, I, because in Kendama, it's not like there's not, not an opportunity yet in Kendama where people are just doing it full time like that's not a regular thing at all in kendama and so pro right. and kendama is usually we refer to the pros as people who have sponsors and are of usually have a certain skill level that they are competing in the pro division but i mean yeah. i've looked at your videos and you know i mean you've obviously probably been like what's considered a pro level for many many <laughs> years but for when you're talking about professionally you're talking about just purely making a living off of it uh, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, with juggling, we don't really have as much of a system to have like a, you know, pro model juggling club because mainly like anyone who can contact like a supplier and like the supplier wants to go go with it um, basically can make their own like juggling ball. And like I see like a lot of people who, who juggle professionally um, end up making like a beginner set for for like the audiences that come in to buy a beginner set uh, of juggling balls. Um, so so the pro model system um, is, a, is a little different with juggling, but um, but yeah, yeah, basically, um, yeah, I, I, I've started considering myself a professional juggler because I've, I, that's what, that's what I do right now. I do shows yeah. uh, continuously and yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I think that's amazing that you've been able to turn that into a, a career after dedicating so many, I mean, well over a decade into that craft of yours. I mean, you said you started, when you, yeah. you started when you're eight. I know you started, yeah. you know, I think you yeah, your cousin Lucas showed you in, in Peru, right? And you started out yep. then. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. And to have that hone that skill so much and just, you know, have that actually be able to 
make you like give you monetary gains and like you know like money gains <laughs> in this in, in your life is just amazing it's super entertaining and and actually one thing that's besides shows that i really wanted to touch on you've been juggling for 15 years and i know you started and, and you started competing in wjf nine right yes yes that was my first uh competition yeah First yeah. time I was at WJF and mm. yeah, at okay. the juniors competition. Yeah. 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 And so that was like, and so you've been juggling for like 15 years, but you was that like a four year gap between the 11 years competing or? Um, so WJF nine was 2012. Okay. No, 2013, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I've been I've been competing since like 2013. Um, mm. So yeah, yeah, but that's more like a a, a sport competition. So so right. yeah, it's like just skill based, not performance based. Yeah. Um, so there's like a there's kind of a big difference with juggling because yeah, like a lot of a lot of the time, um, if you're a technical juggler, you could be very boring to watch. Uh, if you don't have like stage presence, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like, but you also need the technique to be entertaining, if that makes sense. Totally. Like, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you need to be good to, for people to like actually enjoy the show, you know? Right. Um, so it's, so I kind of started off, uh, uh, you know, really going that technique, but just because it was fun for me. And then now I'm like, okay, finding new ways on how to interact with the audience better because that's something I've been, you know, learning more. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, as uh, that's that's key to any performance. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. kind of melding the two. Yeah, right. yeah. Like can, keeping that flair, keeping that flair in the in the performance. I, I've seen exactly. in your recent videos on your Instagram. I definitely can see you work in the crowd, and and actually so impressive to me because you're nailing those routines like it's nothing for you and I'm, yeah of course you put in so much work to to nail those down all these tricks over the years but i can definitely see you being super lively with the audience and i'm like and that already takes an amount of focus that's like really impressive and then you're literally just making these routines look like nothing you know when you're doing it which is huge and that makes it the most entertaining so i yeah. I, I have a lot of fun watching the instagram replays just oh, from my phone yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm getting hyped through the screen as you hype the audience up. I'm just like, whoa, like that just happened. You know, makes it hit a yeah. little bit. So yeah, I mean, because a lot of the time, you probably like experience this with kendama, but people who don't do kendama or don't juggle don't have a clue how hard something is, and they also watching it don't have a cue on when to applaud. You know, they're mm -hmm. watching it, they don't want to interrupt, they're not sure what to do they're like watching but you have to you have to have those momentary pauses in a performance that really get, gives the audience the comfort to like oh i should clap right now or oh like i'm having a good time cuz sometimes like jugglers or uh like do a super long sequence of tricks but like people don't know when to react like they want to react but they don't know when to so sometimes you have to, um, yeah, definitely find those moments where you, where you give them that opportunity. So yeah, that's like one thing I've learned um, mm -hmm. with performance juggling. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a huge yeah. point I think for Kanama players to take away too. Mm -hmm. Just a really huge point because we have freestyle, so you have mm -hmm. routines you can do yourself, and you have X amount of seconds to do it, whether it be a minute and a half, forty five seconds. And I think a lot of people forget. It's very easy to forget to play play with the crowd a little bit, kind of give them an emphasis, give them a timing of when to applaud when you land something, give it a little second or two before going to the next trick to really make it hit. Because especially for me, something I struggle with um, just to wait and just give everyone a second to digest. Because you always want to keep going, keep flowing. But it's also, you know, based off your videos, you can really, really tell that it's really nice and actually really effective to just hold on for a second, hype it up, and just continue after that. Yeah. Yeah. And so with, with Kendama freestyle, do you guys take into account in the competition, the audience reaction? 
is that like a very important factor of judging or is that um what would you say or hmm. I think I think the audience reaction can definitely influence the judge's decision, but it's not something that's like a huge main factor. Um, that's that like competitors don't, aren't they don't think they're being judged by the audience reaction. It's really just the uh, really just what the judges think. But I do think the audi audience reaction is so huge because I mean the judges are not only watching, but it's not like their their sense of hearing is blocked off. Like if they're if they're gonna hear a big cheer, they're gonna associate positive positive feedback, you know, from that performance, whether it be a really technical trick or whether, like you said, giving where there was a really perfectly timed moment of of them landing a you know whether like medium difficulty trick trick and then pausing it, hyping the crowd up and the crowd's getting hyped. And then, the, I mean, at the end of the day, that's just super exciting to watch. And the judges, no matter what, are going to be like, yep, lace, like really, like that was a great moment in this performance and it's going to be at, it's going to give them points. So I think the audience reaction, while not a main factor is definitely contributes to a big part of freestyle. Yeah. Yeah. It creates more excitement. So it kind of like makes the judges perhaps judge that routine yeah. a little higher because they're like, wow, that was spectacular you know totally yeah, yeah. totally Fair. that's yeah. awesome yeah for yeah. for competing specifically mm -hmm. after i find this very very impressive because you've been juggling for 15 years and you've got some incredible achievements recently it's not often that players in kendama have been playing for a very long time decade plus 12 years 13 some who have been playing for 15 years it's very rare for players to continue to achieve and actually yeah achieve competitively at a high level but here you are and over the summer you compete at the wjf and you're the first, you, first overall championships in paris and you got third place and then you yeah. also got ranked number one juggler in the top 40 jugglers of 2023 so you're still clearly on not only still a very very high achieving juggler but you're still getting better and honing your skill and i know you've won at least 40 competitions I, I do according to juggle in fandom. I don't know how accurate that offset is. I'm sure you, you probably have more. Um, you said 40, 40. Yeah. yeah. I counted 40, like I like 40 comps, like 40, 40. Yeah. Maybe it was 40. like subsections. Interesting. Maybe it was like subsections of, of things like, but yeah, regardless. Ma yeah. Maybe it was like, uh, I think they included perhaps some convention games that I might okay. have won. Yeah, okay. so yeah, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like like that it's the main competition. Yeah, I've not even competed in 40 like WJFs okay. cuz there okay. hasn't been 40 WJFs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. It, either way. Yeah, either way. Yeah. After I'll take it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> After getting third place this summer, I mean, I would love to know what did that preparation look like we talk about a lot we talk a lot about competition on this podcast in kendama because we're really huge fans of competition i'd love to know about what you what the prep was for that comp and what did you sacrifice leading up to something like this competition in paris i mean it's huge yeah um yeah this competition was definitely the most intense one i've done probably ever um it was intense for multiple reasons for myself because i'm i'm also entering like the the performing world so mm. performing juggling and technical juggling like i wouldn't say they're completely different but they're quite different at times because performing juggling you train your muscle memory to be entertaining you know mm. and like to walk around and like entertain the crowd and sometimes the messier the trick the harder it looks so the audience likes it more um but with uh with uh sport juggling it's more you have to make it as clean as you can mm. it, because any messiness creates a deduction. So, um, so you have to like, in a way, retrain in a technical way. Um, yeah. To, to make patterns super clean. So I was starting a, the hideaway circus gig that I was a part of recently. And um, I was starting that like, when I was starting to, uh, I guess I was training for WJF right before, but then I was also starting the gig and learning all the choreography of the show and learning all the, um, you know, creating a full new act for this, for, for Hideaway specifically. And um, 
basically I was trying to keep track of two types of juggling at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, okay, creating my acts, putting a lot of tricks. I put some tricks that were in my routines for WJF into my act. Um, and um, yeah, to just help practice it over time. Uh, but then this was also an open air outdoor show. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it was like outdoors. So I had to uh, keep track of training while we moved around and there wasn't like a fully stable spot to practice constantly. Uh, like I have here in Texas, which was a gym. So, um, so really it was, it was kind of stressful, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, you know, practicing outside and then like a, a breeze, like the, the, the routine is going well. Uh, but then a breeze would just ruin the, the, the routine a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I, I wasn't fully sure how solid I was at the routines for a while. Um, mm. but then also weirdly enough, juggling in the wind. Um, and if you're able to manage that, then later when there's no interference at all, um, things feel cleaner, uh, <laughs> because you're used to overcorrecting. So you're, um, yeah, it's like a weird thing that I've noticed from juggling in the wind to then going into a gym constantly. I'm like, yeah. okay, I've improved, but I haven't seen the improvement. Um, so with with this competition, mm. I, I I honestly tried to train the most I could, but sometimes it was very it, it was very difficult. But then I also wanted to do the best I could. Uh, there there was also a rigorous process of uh, submitting things for this competition. Uh, oh. Like we had to do the routine five times in a row um, wow. on video with like a five minute break in between um, that basically we had to do the routine twice dropless uh, once with three drops, once with two drops, once with one drop. Like those are the maxes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was the requirement to like that they were putting us. Oh, Oh no, someone's sorry. Um, that was the requirement um, they were putting us at in order to um, do the best we can can in Paris because it took place mm. in Paris. Um, and in a way, this competition's goal is to make juggling an Olympic sport uh, eventually. And um, so th we're trying to give the best representation of juggling. Uh, so it was a very rigorous. Um, like way of doing this competition which i've never done with any other of these competitions but because it was like the the ultimate overall championship where i'm competing against other overall champions um yeah it had to it had to really be like top notch so um yeah it was it was stressful <laughs> yeah. but but uh in the end we i i feel like we did such a great job um, mm -hmm. yeah i'm proud of the broadcast because it was like like very close to perfect routines against each other and yeah. the level was really there and the pressure was really on <laughs> so it was it was a good time yeah yeah <laughs> and i i find it really interesting how they set such a high standard going into the competition i mean of, of course you know they want you guys to be really up to par and then just have everything really dialed to put on the best show you know you possibly can but I've never, that's never happened in a Konami competition so far where they actually required you to be that dialed in on say a performance or something like that, or a specific set of tricks. I find that really, really interesting. I think that's actually really cool. It's, it's very rigorous. Like I, I'd assume, just like you said, but to get up to that level, I mean, there's gotta be some standards set. I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it definitely. Yeah. Was, was a competition I'd never done. Like, like I've never done before. So. Uh, but like we were trying to also impress a non-juggling audience, right. I wanted to show like we're 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 solid, you know. We yeah. like we have the level uh, that could make this, um, you know, an Olympic level uh, discipline. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 That's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And 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 for this competition, were you? We're using just all different types of objects. Like I know you were like balls, clubs, and rings. We're using all three of those. Yep, those were the three three props that we competed in. Um, yeah, yeah. That's also big. 
that's a big thing with uh with juggling there's always new props that are popping up that people do and then some are getting more popular like coop juggling or poi and it's mm. like okay how will those be incorporated because juggling it's not very limited um to you know only three props but those are the three main props that people um you know the traditionally uh used as the main juggling objects so so yeah yeah yeah. yeah how so how do you handle after all these competitions and all these uh like intense sports yeah sports juggling competitions that you entered how do you handle nerves on stage when you're performing or yeah when you're doing your routine yeah um yeah i mean this has been like it's honestly a journey of of uh learning what works best because you can put sometimes nerves really help um you yeah. know sometimes they really make you in the zone super focused um and then sometimes they just create too much tension that you can you know in a way barely move <laughs> yeah. um when when you should be relaxed um so for, are you asking for competition or for performance um, oh yeah i got when i when i asked that question i was like oh i guess i have to remember that those are two different things for competition for competition how do you how what's worked for you in, in the best in handling nerves yeah um i feel like if i'm being honest i'm never truly ready uh for the competition uh, it's kind of like with juggling there's always hundreds of things that could go wrong well the patterns and process like each throw is a risk pretty much um mm. but the thing that i feel like is important for jugglers is just to know that you practice enough and just trust your practice um because um yeah, every time you release a ball, it can be a nerve-wracking experience, you know, because <laughs> it's out of your control. Um, mm. But, um, yeah, for me, I've, I honestly, and I do this a little bit with performing, too. It's like, I try to have fun with it, you know? I, like, because sometimes you put so much pressure on it when it's like, I can do these tricks. I've done them several times. Uh, let me just show people what I can do. You know, sometimes I just get like, sometimes I go back to the performing mentality of like, let me just give them a good show, even though it's a competition and it's yeah. more rigid. Um, just like, uh, yeah, at, at that point, I just trust that I've practiced enough and go out there, try my best and whatever happens in a way happens. Uh, but yeah, but then I also, if I'm not nervous, I get nervous that I'm not nervous mm. because I'm like, oh, am I not being careful enough? <laughs> it's like yeah. a weird mental process. So I like a little bit of nerves is always good because there you know you're focused. Um, so that's one thing I've found at least. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely an ongoing, an ongoing thing at times. Uh, yeah, especially with the ultimate overall championship that I just did. I'm like, yeah, like the people I'm, I was competing against were just so solid. And like, like I was competing against people who like didn't drop in their routine. And you're like, OK, <laughs> I made my routine kind of hard and uh, I have to pull it off. Um, so, yeah, sometimes you have to like weirdly. You're like, OK, I acknowledge the, the nerves are there, but I've practiced enough, so I'm not going to care exactly like it sounds weird but i'm not going to care so much because if i think about it too much then it can like you know make me unnecessarily tense so i just try to relax and just do it <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah you mentioned practicing enough a couple of times when do you know you've practiced enough like what's is there something you look for or is it more of like a feeling oh man i mean that's a complicated question. Some jugglers do like a, like, try to do nine out of 10. Like, they use the rule that I hit this trick nine out of 10 times. Like, if I, if I practice it. Um, yeah, that rule for me never, uh, like, hasn't always fully, fully worked. Cause I feel like if I do it well, 
I feel like after doing it several times, like it ends up lacking later because I put so much effort in the first few attempts. Um, so really, um, if I practice something enough, I sometimes in my practice, I uh, just try the trick when I'm not fully warmed up. And if I can hit it there, like first or second try, it's like, okay, that's definitely a solid trick. Um, because I'm like my body mental, like is mentally prepared and can do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's also, yeah, sometimes you're not fully sure. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely sometimes if you think about the trick too much, you're like, that trick is hard, but then you're like, I can do it. Like it, it I don't know if you experienced the same thing, uh, with Kandama. Like if you think about how, like the type of trick it is and all the different things that go into it. Uh, you can always, in a way, doubt yourself, but but then you're like, but I can do the trick, you know, like I've practiced, and so, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a way, in a way, my short answer is I'm not fully sure, but uh, sometimes I can uh, figure out figure that out. <laughs> yeah, I really yeah. like what you said about uh, if you if you like a good metric for you is okay. Can I do this trick cold? Like, can I do this trick first or second try cold? No warm up. I think that's yeah. a really uh, good metric, and I've definitely experienced that in my practice too. If I'm doing a competition and I'm okay, I'm just like day of the competition. I'm like, okay, first first couple minutes of play of the day, and I'm knocking down tricks or in it for yeah for a competition that I know I know I'm gonna have to do later on and I get him first or second try. I'm like, okay, that one's solid because I don't even have any warm up right now. And I think that's a really good basis to, uh, to base a person's proficiency on because like, like you said, it's like, can you do this without any reps going into it? Well, then imagine, well, it's not, then it's like, imagine how good you're going to be at it when you actually have that, that warm up when you actually have that, your brain's functioning, you know, after like 10, 15, maybe an, especially after an hour, it's just like, all right, now I'm really on. So, uh, I right. definitely have tapped into a state that's, that's better with, with after practicing, but if I can get the trick cold, then it's really, really good sign. So I totally, I love that you brought that up yeah. because I think it's super applicable. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Do you have a thing with Kandama that you have to like really get the feel down at first? Like you have to warm up. Do you have any like Kandama warm ups that you do like just to get the feel down of like touching the object, you know, like, um, mm -hmm. Uh, like with juggling for example like there's a lot of drills you can do just to activate the hands and mm. just kind of like you know get the speed down and just like do you guys have something similar with kendama in some way or, or uh, we have uh, nothing. yeah go ahead. I mean, well i would say for like just already decided like practice routines i wouldn't say it's something that's super prevalent in kendama right now there are Classic around around tricks that people usually do to warm up sometimes if they're going that route. Like, oh, I just need a five minute, 10 minute warm up to get into the session. There's, you know, around tricks like around the world where you do every cup, touch every cup, spike, maybe right. go to every cup and then spike in between. Um, do these basic movements, you know, just make contact with the ball and the can a couple of times for, you know, five to 10 minutes. And then people seem to be warmed up after that. But it really varies uh, from person to person. Um, I, I found that for me, sometimes I actually uh, like warming up with my opposite hand just to really fire uh, fire my brain up. I just think it's a little more of a challenge. And then after those first couple of minutes, I go back to my dominant. I'm like, oh, OK, I feel ready. Yeah. So there's been a couple of different routines I've heard out there, but nothing really super set yet. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that, may, that makes sense, because with, with Kendama, you really got to... Um you know you tilt the tama you, you like tilt the tama to spike it and like really get, like i feel like for me i've I've done the around the around the world uh like cups uh yeah. stuff a good amount and like after doing that then you really got a feel for uh doing all the all the other stuff uh, yeah so yeah it's interesting with juggling we have like like with ball juggling you can do so many like just random like like even throws right on mm. throws um and it's like you got to practice all these different throws that can go in uh, into a pattern you know uh, mm. so so when warming up you can um 
you really can like shuffle those around and mm. it really gets your brain going as you said mm. uh, so yeah it's interesting yeah. yeah how often do you spend do you spend warming up uh, in a session usually how how long does it take um well i do like a stretching session that i nice. remind myself to set a timer for f for five minutes uh that's like i set a timer just to keep my attention <laughs> yeah because sometimes i can get like excited and just start juggling and then all my muscles hurt uh but i'm like just prioritize for five minutes i'm gonna focus on all the parts i i could stretch muscle wise yep so that usually loosens me up and then um I usually start, I, I usually train balls, rings, clubs, like in order. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I start, um, I start with like three balls and do like all these drills. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, side swaps, like juggling uh, side swaps. I'm, I'm, I became a little familiar after your documentary. <laughs> oh, gotcha. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I couldn't describe okay. it um yeah yeah they're they're basically like uh, like a variation of different heights mm -hmm. uh within a juggling pattern so i do a lot of like varied patterns with three balls that really prepare like my hands for the height yeah and speed and like crossing and non-crossing patterns um so i i think that really sets me up well for the for the um practice session so I do that a good amount. Then I also like, then I just increase the number and do a lot of those as well. It's just because it keeps me like accurate. It's like a good warm up. So I'm kind of warming up all the way through. Um, yeah. When you ask me like, how long do I warm up? I kind of warm up for like the entire practice for the most right. part, because like all these tricks. Um, yeah. Before I'm going to train this trick, I warm it up. Uh, yeah. And I go from trick to trick that I'm like trying to, and yeah. And it's not, not always like the same, like my practices vary, like in terms of what tricks I try. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, yeah. I kind of warm up all the way through for when I'm, when I'm about to do the trick, I'm like, okay, just, I, I obviously try, try the trick uh, to see how consistent it is. And if I need to improve it, I may like, go back and warm up on it like right by practicing like the elements of the trick um yeah. so yeah 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 no that makes that makes total sense like you're all you're basically it sounds like your session you're always building towards a bigger trick or a, or a more difficult variation and then in order to do that as as smoothly as you like or as, as good as you like you use easier variations to build up build up build up that yeah, makes total sense for your yeah. so I, I did see your 30 minute practice vlog video and a big a, what stood out to me was a large part of it was just you chasing uh these mental goals you call them mental goals for yourself in your session and i wanted to ask you how first of all what for the audience what are these mental goals that you're setting for yourselves how do they work and how and i want to ask you how important are they in your practice session to keep it i guess like fun and diversified yeah um so mental goals for me are in a way just they they help with my consistency um for example if i'm practicing five balls back crosses which are five balls like behind the back over the shoulders into my hands yeah just again. a trick that just looks completely impossible yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah that one um <laughs> um uh so so basically if i'm training that trick um i have a like a decent amount of of throws that i feel comfortable with um that i keep consistent and they tell me um like for, for example in the in the video you saw my goal was 50 catches right of that trick um that's a very attainable goal for me mentally uh and it it just keeps it but it's also like slightly challenging that it's not super easy um so it just keeps me in check to make sure i'm still pushing that trick or at mm -hmm. least keeping it at the same level that i want it to um so i i create these like mental goals kind of on the spot in my practice 
in order to keep these tricks in check. Um, so yeah, if I if I'm juggling, I'm like, oh, I could do fifty catches of this. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So I do that then just to keep like just to keep that honed in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, so. And the second question was how important or what was the second yeah, question? How, so how important, I, so based on what you just said, are your practice sessions, do they, it sounds like they vary then, right? Like they always kind of vary a little bit at least. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Based on like kind of what you're feeling and what you're into. How? Kind of, yeah. Okay. Some people, the reason why I'm asking these questions is because some, a lot of players in Kendama actually don't. They struggle to think of, okay, how should I structure a session? How should I, what should I do? There are, there's so many tricks to learn here. Or what should I really spend my time focusing on? And I really think that having a route made is, is great already. If they get a recommendation from another player or you get some inspiration, but I think the ability to make goals for yourself and kind of give yourself the own route is, is super powerful. So how important yeah. is it for you to have these mental goals? So I think chasing something in my experience has always been motivating. Right. Um, for me, um, like for me personally, they definitely keep, um, so there's always like, you can always push the ceiling of your juggling mm -hmm. or of your Kendama plane. You can always like, Oh, I hit that one trick once, you know? And yeah. I'm like, okay, I broke new ground. Um, uh, and maybe I hit it again, but like you hit it again after multiple attempts. Um, like, one thing I want to keep in my juggling is like consistency, you know, um, like, uh, for example, like I'll use a Kendama example. If I, if I hit like a juggle to spike or I juggle 10 times to spike and I hit that once, but then I struggle to get a regular, just juggle to spike once, like you hit it once, but you, you haven't gotten consistent with the lower level. Um, like your general kendama level in a way that you can you can prove it's like okay you're still working on the juggle to spike um mm -hmm. so so in a way um for me what i've what i've done one year it's like i pushed the ceiling of my juggling and i've tried super hard to get all these crazy new tricks uh which has been great uh but then i'm like okay i pushed the ceiling now i want to like push the floor you know, the minimum what I can do, I, I want to get that even more consistent to maybe eventually push that to where my ceiling is and then keep breaking ground, then keep, you know, that's kind of like, um, that's kind of what I, I want to do. Cause really with performing juggling, um, and, and probably Kendama competitions, uh, the nerves kick in and you want to like, what you can do is the minimum, <laughs> Sometimes, right. you know, the minimum of what you can do is like, like I want to, even on a bad day, I want to be able to do like 50 catches of five ball back crosses. You know, those are kind of my mental goals that I want to like, I do every practice or I do often that I'm like, okay, that's where I minim like the minimal I want to, like, I want to be at. And those goals also help me like, um, because you can always be like, oh, I want to hit 100 catches or 150 catches of five ball back crosses. Uh, but then that's incredibly difficult and you're not very encouraged to keep going for the goal. Like you'll probably go for it and maybe get close. But if you set a goal that's like easy, but like decently challenging, like they're... Um, there you feel more accomplished, you know, you feel consistent. So these mental goals are just a test of my consistency, but also sometimes not even like a super difficult test. It's just like a, a recheck on, you know, uh, yeah. On my consistency. So, so yeah. 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 That's, yeah. I really, Nick and I talk a lot about consistency. So you're, that's just like, totally resonating. I know it's resonating with us both really, really hard. And I think that building what you talked about, building the, like raising the floor. So yeah. yeah. So I'm so with that. We talk about just yeah, building the foundation and it's like you said, I mean, if it, like you want to be really consistent, so on, the, on your worst day, you can, you have that minimum standard of what you can do. And 
that you're it's it's i mean i heard from i just from what i've seen around juggling you're, i i i already know that your minimum standard your, your baseline consistency is super super high and that's because you put it in the you put in all this work and i think it it not probably not only helps so much for competition of course but helps you with chasing those really really difficult tricks when you do try, decide to all right i'm going to dedicate the session to you know instead of doing 50 back crosses like all right i'm going to get 50 back crosses you know maybe when you go for a trick like that one amazing trick you did the db97531 with the clubs like now you're yeah. way more prepared to do that trick because your seven club consistency is just like this you know and so now right. when you do push you can reach high um but uh thanks to all that time you put into that foundation so uh that's yeah. that's awesome that's really cool you said that and hearing that from a really really accomplished juggler like yourself is uh is massive yeah yeah thank you yeah uh yeah i mean it really just gives you like one thing like my pet peeve sometimes well pet peeve may be a little harsh of a term but like <laughs> do you ever encounter like a kendama player uh i'm applying it to kendama but like for me, when I encounter a juggler that I see online hit some incredible tricks and then I meet them in person and they're nowhere near that level, like in practice, you know, um, or like they like they're struggling to do something that's like, you know, like way lower level. And you're like, uh, you know, it's like I never for me, I want to be the juggler that is consistent with what I put on, put out online in a way, uh, not just for other people, but just for myself, you know, I don't want to be like, like, Oh, I hit that one crazy trick once, but God, I'm nowhere near that level. You know, like, I mean, I guess the DB and that seven, five, three on the clubs is one of those that I'm like, okay, I hit once way out of way out of my league, you know, uh, mm -hmm. So I'm like gonna focus. I'm gonna focus on raising the the level that so that trick can be easier next time I hit it. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that relates with kendama. <laughs> that that really hits home. <laughs> that really, yeah. really hits home. Yeah, there's been a lot of. I mean, like I I always like to say, you know, at least for me, I've always tried to be the best I can be. Like when performing in person, whether that's for not even for a competition, just maybe going to jam with friends. You know, I think it's really, really cool to be able to be capable of doing tricks in person. You know, doing it on video is one thing, but if you have a level that's relatively high when you're do doing it live in front of other people, then it's, I think that's the most impressive. And I've always thought that those are the most, uh, those are the players who impressed me the most too. When I would go into a competition, see them play just practicing in the corner, I'm just like, oh, they're really, really insane. And they're right there. That's not a video, no edits, no nothing. It's just all happening. So I think that's the most impressive thing uh, for me too. So I really hit home there. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of players who, um, there are definitely some players who prioritize filming tricks and they'll just go hard, go insanely hard and dedicate a ton of time to going for one trick just to hit it once. Right. Like they don't want to get consistent at it. Cause I mean, the reason they're filming it is because it's so out of their league that, you know, they're hoping to get it on camera one time. Um, which is not a bad thing. It's just and, and not a not a like an inherently bad thing to play Kanama, the way to play Kanama, but um, that totally exists in Kanama where people are definitely less consistent in person because they, you know, they choose to spend their time recording tricks that they're hoping to get once in maybe an hour, two hour, three hour, four, four hour, even 10 plus hour grind. Um, so that definitely happens. That, that, there's definitely some players like that for sure. But the best pros, the best players are truly the ones who are, I, I'd say are as crazy as they are on camera as they are in person. Like the, the level's the same. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Uh, in the juggling community, there's also like an understanding for, for certain things. Like if someone's very creative in a video and really finds every combination to that concept in that video, you're like, okay, maybe they don't do all those combinations constantly. They did it to fulfill the concept in the video. Um, mm. and it's like, oh, it's great to see, you know, like, um, yeah, like those, yeah, sometimes they're very creative videos and they have to end the video with like a big trick. You're like, if I see them in person, I'm not going to ask him like, Hey, can you do that big trick that you hit there? Cause it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's obviously a hard trick that they wanted for the video, but like, yeah, I kind of like judging the like general level of someone's, you know, ability. And yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I think that's, that's important most of all. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> is, is making videos something that's super popular uh, in the juggling community right now? Let's say for maybe not just Instagram, but YouTube. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's actually, I, it, it's actually decreased in popularity YouTube wise. Um, like it used to be huge in like the 2010s and like early 2000s, like we got some like really crazy cool videos. And that was kind of because we didn't have Instagram and we didn't have, and it's easier to put together like a one clip video. And honestly, I feel like one clip videos are more appreciated among the community or like it's easier to appreciate that one trick um than like 40 tricks like individually each 40 trick like no one's gonna comment on every single trick so i feel like uh the the instant um you know thing is like oh i'll post this one trick and see what people think of that one trick you know that's kind of like the thought process nowadays um but uh but yeah there used to like there there still are of course youtube videos that are amazing coming out Uh, juggling wise but like instagram is one of the like you see all the big tricks that are hit Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of rare that they just put it as part of a video uh, only um they probably post it online separately uh like like as on instagram and they're like oh i hit this trick then you can see a ton of other tricks with this trick in a youtube video that sometimes happens but not also very often either um yeah it's definitely decreased in popularity but i still have an appreciation for people who make some really nice videos and i hope to keep making really nice like videos on youtube of that sort but um but yeah definitely not like it used to be um but yeah yeah what about kendama is that is that common nowadays to do like long videos on youtube like multiple tricks i'd say I'd say a little less. I mean, it's definitely not as popular as it was back when Nick and I first started in the early like 20, 2012 through like 2017, 18. Uh, the, mm-hmm. With each year passing by year from like 2012, uh, especially, well, yeah, especially 2012, um, Instagram has become more and more popular. So a lot of people will just uh, put a lot of their time into filming tricks and just putting them out one by one on Instagram or even making Instagram edits, like even making edits that are like in a minute and a half or two minutes long, put them on Instagram. So it's a little less popular now than it used to be for Nick and I, but I mean, there's still a pretty huge, it's still pretty prevalent on YouTube I and mean, people still definitely take their time to put together quality videos online of montages of tricks or even different styles of Kanama content as well. But it's still pretty prevalent, but it's not like the main thing, like how it used to be, um, when Nick and I started playing like 12 years ago. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed at least for juggling as well. Um, like the views on YouTube have gone crazy down because I feel like people are lazy to click on a link, <laughs> link in bio, like maybe 40% of people click it, you know? So it's like, like on Instagram, you definitely get way more attention for, for, for clips you do. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I, I still have an appreciation for like the composition of a video, like a long form video. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays but it's yeah. like the barrier to entry. They could link the link and buy. People see a link and buy. It's like, no, I like the like the amount of effort it takes to to switch platforms like Instagram and YouTube, it's actually huge. It's like a, it's like enough for people to, to make people like, oh, I'm good. Like I'll just keep scrolling. <laughs> like, right. It's so funny. Yeah. And I've also noticed like attention spans too. It's like oh, yeah. like yeah, it's like I'd rather just watch all your like individual tricks like for the same amount of time as I watch the entire YouTube video because I have more th- more to fidget with. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I don't know. Like it's just kind of the society we live in. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's definitely some art. I definitely do appreciate the the art behind long form, like you said, too. Like the a nice quality video. I think it always uh it definitely always hits. It's really, really nice to it's really enjoyable to watch. For yeah. For your one, yeah, one last thing about the WJF in, in Paris, you you mentioned uh, in, in your Instagram post about it. You mentioned it was one of the most physically demanding competitions of your entire life, and I wanted to ask you the when you're juggling when you're juggling at a high enough level. You said this as well that it becomes really physically demanding. What type of physicality is involved in juggling that maybe the everyday person might not be privy to? They might not notice right off the bat. 
Yeah. Um, well, it's definitely more cardio than people understand it to be. Um, yeah, some people are like, why are you sweating? You were just juggling. <laughs> and I'm like, it's it's like even doing this for, you know, like and, and moving around and shuffling, you know, like it's it's uh, yeah, it's definitely very um, it's a cardiovascular activity, honestly. And it like, um, you know, it can it tires out the arms. Um, and I feel like technical juggling is definitely kind of an unexplored field uh, field in some way, or at least to this level, because I have so many friends and slightly myself included, but I've avoided most of injuries, but like, I'll, I have a lot of friends that, you know, were out for a full year because, you know, they've gotten injured from, you know, wrist injuries, uh, shoulder injuries, um i i like training for the competition um, for example ball juggling was basically the nerve right here uh, was being like inflamed just because of the grip and pos hand positioning yeah um so it's kind of like um yeah basically like sometimes the nerves hurt and parts of the hands hurt um if you don't you know, like if you don't have a full training regimen, but I feel like people learn along the way, kind of as they get slightly injured that, oh, shoot, okay, I got to, you know, stretch more and I got to, um, you know, in a way, work out different muscles. Um, you know, like for me, I've, I've had the problem of, of, uh, of posture just because juggling pulls the front muscles mm -hmm. and it doesn't really work out the back muscles so often like my position can be like this because these muscles are stronger than the other ones so i have to do like some some back workouts and stuff um so so um yeah basically uh why i was physically demanding or the question was, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. You're, you're answering it totally fine. I was, I was wondering about the, the physicality that goes into juggling that people might not notice because I mean, some people might, I mean, you know, I saw your warming up in your video, in your documentary, you know, you're stretching, you have a band, you're doing some band pull parts, the stuff. And, you know, for somebody who might not know about juggling, some people could be like, Oh, like why, what, why are you doing that? Like, it's just juggling, like kind of you're alluding right. to, but obviously when, especially when you're doing it at a high level, like you being definitely taxing. So, but yeah, for the competition as well, what kind of, what was the physical hardships that went into that? I mean, I can imagine it was a lot. Yeah. Um, well, so one thing was this, this nerve in my hand that was, uh, I was trying to train, but I could only train for a certain amount of time. So it was like pressing, <laughs> Like it was, uh, which I've, I've, I've contacted like a physical therapist about it. And I just have to like, you know, like really work it and take out the tension. Mm. Um, so, so that was one thing. And um, yeah, just, uh, just the whole record it for five times in a row wow, yeah. that like took me a long time because you do like maybe the first two or three runs of it, like, well, but then like, exhaustion hits and you drop more than you're allowed to mm -hmm. uh so so yeah that was 100 percent way more physically demanding than yeah yeah and uh yeah it, it was definitely a lot a lot more to handle than most years just because of how busy my schedule was as well mm -hmm. i was having to submit things but then also like my day job is juggling but then in my free time i had to train for this yeah. juggling so it's like a lot of people like have a day job or like but then they go to go to rest you know mm -hmm. um like after work and they can like okay watch a show or like something like that for me i was like okay this is the time i have right now and i have to make sure my routines are consistent when i've been juggling a lot of the day mm -hmm. and also doing like all kinds of choreography for the show so mm -hmm. That definitely added on the physically demanding for me. So yeah. it was just a busy season in my life. But uh, but yeah, but speaking about just general physicality of juggling, I mean, I've had like, like I've slipped a disc in my back several, t like a few times. 
just because the weight of the patterns, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that puts a lot of tension on like my, my leg, like my calf and uh, not my calf, uh, my, my, my leg muscles. Um, so, so yeah, my, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> my, uh, in my leg uh <laughs> when you do squats uh the my i guess quads Quality, my quads yeah. uh yeah. no but i'm i'm looking for my, the the nerve there that you do a lot of squats can be irritated um a nerve oh I'm not sure uh, the yeah anyway uh, basically a lot of tension in the leg so I, like that that causes like my lower back to like slip a disc and mm. oh. uh, so basically you know i've i've started like you know warming up my legs and making sure they're not super tense but yeah. then they inevitably get super tense just from practice so i have to like foam roll it and right yeah so it's it's a very specific training in some way and it's like us technical jugglers have had those problems, but it's not like a super explored field. So we have to kind of like take tips from one another and just kind of like, oh yeah, my doctor recommended this one. We're yeah. like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So <laughs> Yeah. No, that makes total sense for Oh, I remembered hamstring. My there hamstring. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's what I meant to yeah. Anyway, not important anymore. <laughs> no, it's all good. Yeah. yeah i can only imagine how mentally draining that must be too uh i know for canal players really zoning it it can be I mean, canal events usually usually players are playing the most they play relative to how often they play during their year in their regular lives like at kadama events where they go to the weekend and they play for like 10 hours a day every single day um yeah I can, and it is exhausting for sure not only just because you're doing a ton of squats but I mean, just focusing in and trying to hone in on doing tricks the entire day, it's going to be draining. So I can only imagine uh, how draining that is for you when you're doing your day job, which is juggling, and then tracks over comp, which is also juggling at a really high level. So I'm, I'm sure the physical, the physical part of it is is a huge, I mean, there's huge mental stress uh, there too as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and then, yeah, and it's also a mental thing of like, I've done so well in the past in the competitions. I want to do well here too. Mm. And it's like, yeah, I'm like, it's the most, it was the most competitive competition I've done, but then I have the less, the least amount of time I've ever had to train for it. <laughs> so I'm just like, all right. But, but yeah, we made it work. <laughs> yeah. Made it work. Yeah. Yeah. Made it work. Yeah. Which is insane. <laughs> that's super, that's super cool. You, um, you talked about, you know, I heard a lot about form. Uh, your friend, your friend Spencer. Um, no, I'm sorry. Your friend in the documentary. I'm blanking on his name. Was his name Spencer? Uh, Lewis Scott. Scott Sorensen. Oh, Scott Sorensen. Uh, your yeah, friend yeah. Scott said you've always had a high focus on form and copying good form from an early age. Uh, keeping hands low, standing tall, shoulders tight, not chasing an object that was misthrown, stuff like this, and and form. I'm wondering if that was a huge, were you always consciously focusing on form? Cause in Kendama form is a topic that is, is seldom talked about. I feel like it, there's so many um, styles in Kendama, but there are players that we can look and analyze that have the Alpha form for X trick, you know? Um, so I wonder how big of an emphasis it was for you on form from when you were starting out. Was that something you're consciously focusing on or was that something you kind of picked up unconsciously? Yeah, um, so I've never been incredibly rigorous about form, if I'm being honest. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I would say a little bit more unconsciously, but it was kind of more of a um, problem-solving thing for me. Yeah. You know, it was like, okay, like I had a few pointers at juggling conventions. Like people were like pointing out, oh, I see you're holding your breath while you're trying to execute this trick or you're – putting a lot of tension in the shoulders and the face and those things I'm like, okay, I try to remind myself pretty often. Um, but I feel like this is one thing that like, I recommend, like I would recommend to people like, is like, like, I feel like the amount of time I spent just 
like trying tricks and really getting to know juggling um like that I feel like really made me find the more efficient or like the most efficient ways that I, at least I know uh to do the trick to do the tricks and then I also like you know watching juggling videos can analyze like um like what's the best you know I like okay I I shouldn't juggle with my hands too high up here because it gets in the way. Um, but yeah, it, it, for me, it was more, I guess, unconscious and kind of, well, saying it's unconscious, but also it's, it's more, it, it takes time just to get to know juggling and, you know, you're like, okay, let me try like throwing from down here. Like, you know, being able to analyze things that way. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, and I know, like, I knew, like, the general principles kind of as I went along, but then, like, applying them, it's just more time doing the trick. Right. And then you're like, okay, it could be easier if I did it this way, you know? Um, like, your yeah. form gets Yeah. more proficient as you, I, I, your form evolves as you get more proficient with the trick. It sounds like unconsciously, it'll like improve as you, the, the more you practice it. And then you'll find, like, if you look at videos in the past, I'm sure you can find some differences when you're doing a trick. Like ten years ago versus two years ago, because the like the look of your body is different. Just the how you do it is different. Um, Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of like at first when you're doing a trick that you're not used to, your body will freak out in whatever way because it's like trying to maintain the trick that's new. Yeah. Um, and then once you hit the trick, it's like, OK, maybe it's not perfect form at all. But you're like, OK, at least I got it. Then you try to hit the trick again. And then like, OK, like I, I can see how it can get more consistent. And then you hit the trick another time and another time. And then you're like, OK, I can make this slightly easier on myself and, you know, fully execute maybe better form or like you get used to the motion and have control over it, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and other in, in Kendama, there's definitely, I, I did say that there was there are players that you can see that have like really optimal form for a, a type of trick. And this usually means they're the best at this type of trick in Kendama and, and people, you know, analyze form. It's like, okay, this is, let's look at his form. This is the, this is the best way. And then it really is just up to people if they want to, to decide, decide to copy that. Uh, but also I, I do acknowledge the fact that, well, there is a form of a player that is really, really good that you know, it might go against the the natural way that a player is doing it. And then their natural style, what feels natural for them is what's easier for them to do, even though it's not the, it doesn't look identical to the optimal technique. Have you ever been, has anybody ever said to you in terms of form, like, oh, Spencer, you have like amazing form. You do this with your shoulders, you do this with your arms. And it's something you don't, you're not even consciously aware of that you do. Has that ever happened to you? Mm. Not not specifically, but I would say I've um I've encountered, for example, like <laughs> like the clips of the routine I just posted. Yeah. It's weird how while I'm doing the tricks, I feel way more like panicked than I look. Well, mm. panicked is not the proper word. I, I like I feel like I'm way less clean than what people may perceive on the screen. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like, Oh, that was a messy run. And I like maybe post a clip a little bit. Um, Cause it, it was messy, but not, not bad at all. Like I was like, okay, I'm just, and, and people were like, wow, that was just so clean. Like, like how clean you do it is, is amazing. And I was like, that was, <laughs> I was like, I, that felt very messy at the moment. But then people are like, oh, that, that looks really clean. Um, so, but, but then I'm like, it did not feel that way while I was doing it, uh, like at all. I was like, oh, okay. I was all right. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. Like, like people will probably have said to you, like, how do you get it so clean? And you're just like, I just, I don't know. I just do like, I, I, I guess, I guess I just do it. Right. I mean, you probably, obviously, obviously you practice a ton, but that kind of right. is like correlative. I think mean, that. That, yeah, that kind of made like a connection in my brain to what we were just talking about. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's not like, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, 
maybe I'm my worst critic on, on this, but, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just, yeah. Sometimes I'm, yeah. Sometimes at the moment when I'm doing it, like, it's like, this is not ideal. It does right. not feel like the cleanest it should be. I'm like, you know, I need, need to make it cleaner, but then externally I'm like, that actually looks cleaner than I, than it felt, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So basically your overall focus on form hasn't been super, super conscious when I mean, you picked up tidbits here and there over the years, but for the most part, it's been unconscious development that happens as you uh, kind of get more, more, more and more proficient at certain routines and tricks. Sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's cool for ranking. So you were ranked uh, number one, top 40 juggle 2023. I'm really curious to know how this ranking system works. There's not a lot of actual official rankings in Kendama. There was one last year based off a very new system. It was the first uh, rankings using this new system. So um, it's very new. And I don't know if people will classify it as, a, as legitimate yet, but I'm really curious to know how the rankings of the top 40 jugglers of 2020 like, of this even works every single year. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a competition or not competition. It's a, it's like a chart that's been around. It's like 2004, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It just turned 20 years, I think. But um, this guy named Luke Burridge um, organizes it every year and he puts out a voting video uh, that I think you can, you can still find those voting videos on YouTube, but he's like, like, Hey, it's that time of year again. Um, uh, drop 10 of your favorite jugglers that you've enjoyed this year it's like a very it's very community thing and it's voted by jugglers um so um yeah you list like 10 names of people you really enjoyed and each one of those names is a vote for that person is a vote for that person um so yeah it's been like very popular and like it's kind of like a, a review of the year with 40 different jugglers. Yeah. It's a top 40 list. Um, so basically whoever gets the most votes is number one. And then mm -hmm. like, yeah, it kind of uh, goes from there. And he, he, he started doing, he used to put out one video with all 40 jugglers that it would just like count down yeah. like all the jugglers with all their clips. Um, but now, nowadays he posts like, like this last year, I think he did like three jugglers a day, like mm. counting down the year. Um, uh, although, yeah, and he usually ideally does it like on New Year's, like New Year's um, Eve or New Year's Day. Uh, basically, number one, the number one spot is announced, uh, even though this this last year was a little bit later because he was he was quite busy. So he was he had to um, delay posting the results. So it came out like January like 15th is like when all the, all the people were announced. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's a, it's kind of a really cool chart though, that like jugglers like are like, uh, these are my favorite people this year. And it has to be kind of of that year, even though people are still voting for like all these old jugglers who, like who are absolutely legendary, uh, but no longer post videos. So, but but they sometimes still make it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah. This past year, uh, yeah, I hit number one. So <laughs> that was that was nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it sounds like it's a yeah super big community thing. And I want to ask, how do you or how do they confirm? You know, you said it's voted by jugglers, right? How yeah. do you confirm if the person is a, a juggler or not? Is there some form or some proof? No. I, honestly, like, yeah, like, there's some people who just put, like, single name votes. I like, see. there's, there's, like, there's, like, sometimes you can tell. I mean, I don't think they, ban they, I don't think they really take away the votes or too many of the votes that, like, are right. people who don't juggle. Because yeah. they could know three balls and they're considered a juggler, like who knows? Right. Um, yeah. And yeah, like there's been like a few like spam comments in the past of like a random guy, like 
I don't know, like if someone's like, oh, Markiplier, he juggled. So everyone's like voting, but they're like, okay, that guy clearly maybe isn't like in the community <laughs> per se. Um, but yeah, but then, but then me saying those things kind of put a ton of extra rules of who's in the community, who's not. But, um, but yeah, basically, yeah, he does. He has a few systems that he has to make sure it's like, but yeah, if you're not a quote unquote juggler, like you, you probably could still vote, but you put definitely put more names along with it. You know, like mm. it's yeah, it, it's really not like super strict in that sense. It's just kind of like if you if you see there's like a lot of spam comments, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like okay, something's up. Uh, yeah. But but yeah yeah, it's 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 honestly kind of chill. <laughs> like yeah, right, right. relaxed. Right. So. Well. Yeah, how how many do you know how many votes you actually got this year to get first? No, no, actually, no. Um, I I don't think he releases that necessarily. Mm. But it had to be like over two hundred and something. Like yes. Yeah. But like there's ways to figure out like how many votes you kind of have. Yeah, uh, right. Right. In terms of like you put the name search and you know oh, yeah. and it tells you how many results are in the comment section, oh, but um, yeah. but but no, I have no idea honestly. <laughs> but what do you think contributed the most to your ranking? Did did, did you do anything? Um, was there anything that went particularly well for you in the year of twenty twenty three and in your career of juggling, or did you do anything that? Are there things that you think you did that other that contributed to your ring the most that other jugglers weren't doing? Um, definitely the documentary. Mm. Yeah, the documentary that got released. Um, yeah, by Lewis Kennedy. Uh, yeah, that 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 itself, I think, got the most you know attention because uh, yeah, it was it was an hour and eighteen minutes of of. Uh, yeah, uh, and I feel like that was the best film of the year. Uh, yeah. Not, not that sounds weird for me to say, but it, it, like juggling doesn't have like films, you know. Mm. So it was, it was a, yeah, like him making a documentary with that much work, and you know, like he had like some drone footage, like he went all out with the production of it. Yeah. So, so definitely, um, yeah, definitely caused a lot of attention in the community. Uh, and honestly, I give a lot of credit to Lewis who made it. Like it's just such a such a cool. He he, he did it so well. So um, yeah, yeah, I'd say that. And the like as part of that, the the DB nine seven five three one with clubs. Uh, yeah, that one definitely. Um, yeah, got a lot of attention. So so yeah. Yeah. No, that's absolutely yeah. huge. I actually have it up right now. I'm going to share my screen just so people can know what we're talking about real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to go over it <laughs> so people can, can see. I'll go boom. And then, yeah, okay. So this is kind of, I hope, I wish I could zoom it in. Yeah, I can, but. That was after the pattern. Yeah, that was after, yeah. but yeah, here we go. So, okay. It's about to restart. And then, yeah, I mean, they'll, okay, here it is. It just looks insane. See, yeah, I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it just looks so crazy. I mean, take us, through, so, I mean, you, you can see yourself, I mean, the fact that you, I mean, I mean, at, at that point, I was about to say, I mean, that's super impressive that you just kept juggling seven clubs, but at that point, you, you obviously have seven clubs just dialed in, so, um, yeah. but you, you can see yourself, like, how excited you are, how sweaty you are. You've always been putting in a ton of time during that session uh, for this trick, been a lot of effort. Take us through what it took to really, like, what was the process for getting this trick? Because we did talk about consistency earlier, but you did say like, yeah, there, there. I did go for this trick and grind so many hours to get it once. What's the process to to go through that? Yeah, it. I mean, it took like three or four months of just trying yeah. the trick. I mean, like it was... Yeah, and sometimes for an hour straight, you know, which, yeah, it, yeah, it, no, because in a way I submitted the idea to Lewis for the documentary because it was one of my dream tricks. I was like, mm -hmm. and no one's gotten it. So I was like, 
I was like, but then I was like, okay, maybe like, it's definitely possible within my capabilities. Like I have a solid seven club pattern. I can, you know, like I have a lot of attempts I could do that I could reasonably get this. And I've, I've gotten like other seven club tricks um, that are like complex and back into the pattern. So I'm like, okay, I, this is realistic. Right. <laughs> but, but it was a pain. Like it was to say it was a pain. Sounds like I regret it. I do not. It was just like, whew, like my, my right arm was just like <laughs> dead. Just, that one throw itself it's like yeah uh, yeah and it, i like squat down and like chuck like 40 feet in the air like that one club and the and it has to be like straight up and accurate back right. to the hand you know um mm. and yeah and then like also fit the timing of all the throws underneath then like go back in um yeah like yeah honestly um uh, we were trying to get it the week we filmed the documentary when he was in Texas. And um, I was like, no, there's, it, that was also one of the busiest weeks of my life filming that documentary. We were yeah, running around yeah. getting footage. And then I also still had college to do. And then we went to a juggling festival that weekend. And yeah, and it, like it was, a, it was a cra crazy few days, but like absolutely worth it based off of the results. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, that trick um yeah yeah i'm like why did i put so much time into something that just lasts 10 seconds you know <laughs> how did you go for it how did what what helped you continue to push for that trick because three to four months put it into a trick you know you're someone who isn't spending all day i mean as you said he was super busy I mean, you're doing college at the time you had other performances i'm sure you're on different festivals and stuff too and you know taking time to really dedicate yourself to going for that trick for three to four months is is massive and being how difficult it is, I'm sure you've had, you had moments where you were a little more sometimes discouraged or going through like, ah, oh, like, what do I do? Like, how do I even do this trick? Or am I really making progress? How did, how did you, how do you really navigate that for yourself? How do you keep pushing? Um, yeah, I mean, in a way I reminded myself that it was something I was going to be in a way historical and it was kind of like, for me, it became, um, you know, like this is a trick that'll, like, <laughs> I guess in a way, like motivated me because I'd be the first to do it. If someone else got it before me, I'd be like, what? <laughs> what's the worth of it trying? Because it's like, yeah. okay, I'm going to go through all this pain just to, you know, just to also get it with someone else. Um, uh, it, it sounds funny, but it, like that kind of motivated me um in some way because i you know i i've always watched growing up uh, other jugglers who really pushed you know juggling in, in a direction and really like motivated me by how much they pushed and um another thing was like the documentary was kind of going to suck if i didn't get it you know <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of that was kind of a little bit more pressure but but yeah, I was like, you know, I wanted to get the trick just in a way to complete something I set out to do, you know, just kind of for myself. But then also, um, you know, to, you know, inspire other people, uh, like to be, you know, the juggler that I, I grew up watching, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kept me going in a way. And um, yeah. Yeah. I also tend to be a little stubborn with tricks. <laughs> like I, I don't want to leave until I get it. Um, but this one I had to leave several times for a few months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, no, I've invested enough time. I, I have to get this, you know, I have to, I have to nail it. Um, cause, cause it was also like several times it was so close that it was like, this is just on the tip of my fingers. Like literally, um, like, like yeah. it was just like, it, it, I would go back into the pattern, do a few throws and it just falls apart. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's there. It's, right. it's, it's right there. Like yeah. if I don't get it, like it'll be a long time. till someone else possibly does, you know, okay. like it, <laughs> I'm like, I, I just need to get this, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you, 
yeah when i got it like i just entered a state of like like you you kind of like enter a state like a flow state that you like zone out mm -hmm. and like you just follow the muscle memory comes back in and you like collect because you can't freak out beforehand because if you do you you may mess it up <laughs> yeah right. so you just collect and then you're like wait a minute did I, I just it. do it? Like, it's kind of yeah. like it, you're a little confused because you zoned out, like, in some weird way. And then, yeah. 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 It's yeah, a it's good feeling, incredible, though. Incredible dedication. And, and you did talk about going back into the pattern and losing a couple times. I noticed that you actually went back into the seven club pattern for longer than I thought you would. I thought you would have dropped those and been like, yes, yeah, like before. But you juggled for well over maybe five full seconds. And that's a long time after completing something like that. Is there some requirement of just control that you have to hit to make it legit or is it like some amount of seconds or throws or anything like that? Yeah. Um, so in juggling, we kind of have a requirement for like, it's kind of like some people debate it. I, I don't know, but it's like a sport juggling requirement uh, mm -hmm. of, um, to say you've officially hit a trick, you have to go into the pattern and what we call qualify the pattern, which is do twice the amount of throws as objects juggled. Um, you know, you can't just throw a few throws and then collect, but you basically, like, to say you got the trick, you have to go back into a, a controlled pattern, which usually the standard is uh, for seven clubs, like 14 catches after you know um so so i had to do 14 catches after uh <laughs> but then like looking at the video i did 30 like afterwards um but i was i was honestly just like making sure i controlled the pattern but i like hadn't counted so i was like okay making sure i run it long enough so i can make sure i got the qualify even though it wasn't fully necessary to run it that long i was just like yeah. Okay, it worked out nice. I can do this. I'm making sure, like, rather, like, be super safe. Then, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's that's kind of how I was seeing it at the moment. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> All the makes, more impressive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And honestly, for me, it's for me. I think that's where kendama and, and juggling differ a lot. Is because when I'm when I'm, I know when a kanama trick ends because you like spike, you connect the two pieces, and it's like boom, done. It's like in your like. I think people even watching are like, all right, cool, that that trick is done. They finish. He hit a trick. Yeah. I don't know what it was, but it's done. For juggling, it's like I always thought, yeah, it's not like, it's not like there's an ever an end point in a trick per se for for me from my knowledge in juggling, which was which is very little, still is. But I'm looking at a trick, and it's not like there's a visual like stop of the trick unless you do a finish where you catch all the balls and yeah, as you mentioned, like collect. But I was also wondering about, about that as like the a bit in the terms of a cleanliness of a trick or like what qualifies it like like you said literally qualifying it to be legit of what that mm -hmm. what went into that because I I've done some tricks where in juggling where I've where I've gotten like the the pattern off and I'm like yes and and I I can't control it yet so I'm just like it doesn't feel legit to me but I'm like okay well I think I have the pa I have the pattern there like I can I I'm yeah. paying a little bit now but I'm not controlling it so it's really cool to hear that there's like a standard for that, that people in sport juggling try to you know, maintain. Yeah. 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 Well, it's kind of like the qualify after the pattern is kind of like the spike in Kandama. Mm. You know, if you don't spike it, you like, you didn't finish it. Right. You know, yeah. you didn't do it. Like, I don't know. You can hit like the tight rope, which is an insane trick. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, you can hit that and then like go into lighthouse, for example. Yeah. But if you don't spike it, you didn't get the trick, right? Like right. that's kind of like the weird. Uh, that's kind of like the weird thing with juggling too. You can like go back into a few throws, but you have to like, you know, make sure and do enough throws that it counts. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like, I guess we're not that strict that if we drop after those, like the qualify, we don't get the trick. Right. Even though I kind of like to do for myself to finish and like collect. Um, but but um but yeah definitely like the standard is to qualify it just like the standard is to spike that's i think the correlation um but then there's like there's other ways to look at it too oh, like for example in some of my routines on stage for performing for non-jugglers 
um, basically sometimes I collect the pattern early after I do a trick because it fits the music better. <laughs> you know, I can clearly qualify that trick, yeah. but I like collect because if I take too long, then the, then it won't create as much of an applause, you know, I won't really like people are like, you know, they watch, they watch the pattern for so long af afterwards. They're like, Oh, okay. That was clearly easy or something. But if you hit the trick and then do a few throws after and collect it like people have just seen the trick so they have a better reaction afterwards so so in a way like the qualify after the pattern is kind of a um juggling thing you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, or, no not a juggling thing it's kind of a uh sport juggling thing yeah you know like yeah um, yeah yeah that makes total sense yeah yeah That's all. okay yeah cool no it's yeah, that's, that's great. And, and you did manage, to, I mean, you did mention the flow state earlier. And uh, you kind of went into a flow state and you kind of realized, like, you, you finished the trick and you're like, oh, wait, I just did it. What does flow state, how often would you say you go into flow state in juggling nowadays? Oh, man. Um, so nowadays, uh, just from doing, like, doing shows and maybe not having a, super adequate place to practice all the time it's a little bit harder to get in the flow state um if that makes sense uh well last night i did a juggling practice here at where i usually practice here back home and um i had like enough time you know like i juggled for two hours mm -hmm. and i had like you know enough time there that i could fully really immerse myself in that practice space um so i, I was able to really kind of get in the zone yeah. pretty pretty well like um but definitely it's harder when i'm on the road um yeah it, it's just like yeah yeah like this gym it's like a big gym that i i was by myself right. there listening to music just jamming and like yeah you know, training, but having fun and then like being fully warmed up and like, I have very limited distractions. Um, so there it was kind of easy to do, like to get in into it. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely, uh, it's definitely sometimes hard, like, and at times like, oh, I, I'm so used to kind of having that space Right. And like, but yeah, sometimes it's like, it's, it's very hard to get in there because there's a lot of things happening around you. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. And yeah. what is flow state to you? Like, what, what would you define your flow, flow state as? Um, kind of a state where things kind of feel automatic in a weird way, but then also I'm pretty relaxed. Um, yeah yeah uh and and definitely i guess the heightened end of the flow state is kind of uh um yeah where i can like zone out and really like let my body just do the motions and yeah like like with with the db 975 through on with clubs like yeah that was one of those moments where it's like you you really like have the ultimate in a way focus but you're relaxed like i feel like for me being super focused puts a lot of pressure on the pattern at times mm -hmm. or on myself like oh don't mess up don't mess up like but if i'm able to have a certain amount of focus that i'm that i'm also calm that's kind of like the flow state that's like where i hit like my you know where, where i'm like like really hitting my hardest tricks with ease, you know, uh, that's, that's, I, I think is kind of what I define as the flow state. Yeah. For me. Yeah. And so do you, when you're in the flow state, can you, are you ever actively conscious that you're in it or do you only realize that you're in it once you're out of it? Um, well, I guess, I guess I, uh,
well a bit of both like kind of weirdly enough like it's mm-hmm. kind of like okay i'm in the zone and yeah. stay in the zone um but then later i'm like that was, that was good <laughs> that, yeah. you know yeah so yeah yeah I, I guess i'm conscious that i'm in it but then yeah yeah and sometimes i'm like okay this is going better than i was expecting and, right yeah <laughs> yeah. But, yeah are there any certain conditions that are I mean, over the past 15 years, Jeff, I'm sure you've been in that state in the time. I mean, people who do, I feel like people who do sport and especially a like, hand eye stuff like this, where you're always getting feedback and you're always involved, uh, like mm-hmm. an individual sport where you're, you're in control the entire time. And, uh, I feel like the flow state is tapped into by these people the most. And, and not a lot of people go into flow, like not a lot of people experience flow really ever, like, unless they do something like this, like unless they do a sport or especially something like this, where, yeah, it's very individual. Over the past 15 years, can you draw any, after going to the flow state, I'm, I'm assuming thousands upon thousands of times here, uh, you know, whether it be for five seconds or, you know, full on minutes at a time, can you describe any patterns or any conditions that are consistently met that, that kind of like put you into this zone? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I, uh, I'd say, like, being with limited distractions mm. is good, but, like, I also need, you know, music is essential. Like, just jamming to music. I feel like it's, because I mean, juggling, a lot, like, juggling without music sometimes is, is not great because you're just thinking only about the tricks. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, like, when you're thinking only about the tricks – it can get, um, you know, like it can, it, it can, um, you can be like, oh, why, why don't I do this better? But when you're like listening to music, just unconsciously, just training the muscles, you're yeah. like, you know, the tricks you're doing, but your, your, your mind is wandering a little more. And it's like, it's not as, um, sounds like I'm not focused, but it's like, it's a balance between being too focused and focus. Um, uh, so, yeah, like, in a way, a place where there's also not too much to distract me as well, um, I feel. Um, yeah, where I can just think about my juggling, but then also, obviously, I just think about life <laughs> I, while I juggle and just kind of, like, right. you know, like, let my mind wander a little bit. Um, but... But yeah, I I think definitely music helps uh, warming up properly is like essential because then you're like, why am I struggling? Like if you're not warmed up fully, you're like, why am I struggling with the trick that like I should have down? And then your body feels too tense and you're like, okay, mm-hmm. I need to warm up properly. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that helps a lot because you just loosen up a little more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay so main thing was like a like a really little amount of distractions but not completely not completely uh silent like you you say music is essential and then warming up those are the two big things i i find for myself and you mentioned music and that really brought me back because some of my best sessions with kanama have just been outside i'm not filming anything and i'm just playing the music and i'm literally hitting some of the hardest tricks i've ever landed uh just yeah. just playing outside the music and i'm just like oh my gosh um, so I definitely resonate with that. What, so do you yeah. listen to music in competition too, or do you kind of go music list? Uh, competition, we have like, uh, music, the routine is set to. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. So, so there's, there's music going on there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes I wish I could like listen to my own music, like, listen to my own music like in my head <laughs> but but it's like it yeah i've done like a practice exhibition in front of people where like there was like very low music like somewhere but it's like silent for me and i was like i i didn't like this i had to put my headphones in because i was like mm. i need something um yeah yeah it's yeah yeah but for competition we just have the like, uh, routine music yeah Mm-hmm. Do you find that you noticeably juggle better like, with music than without music, or no? Um, yeah, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, like, 
it, it definitely hypes me up more. Yeah. You know, it's like sometimes you're like entering practice and you're not warmed up and you need something to just kind of wake you up or get you in the zone. Mm -hmm. You know, you need like some, you know, some hard hitting, you know, hip hop or dubstep, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that just helps, you know. Yeah. Sometimes I like listening to like super serious, like meaningful music that's like uh you know really makes you think about what you're doing and you're like oh this is why i juggle you know yeah <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah so i like i like that kind of stuff um because it really motivates you like on the spot um mm. uh, so so yeah and it, it definitely keeps the energy up you know yeah 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 and then for <laughs> teams, when you do when you do music for competitions and things like that do you and your competitors have a set list of music you guys are going to go to, or is it all the same or do you submit it beforehand? Uh, we submit it beforehand, like our music with our routine. Nice. Uh, yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, I, I think mostly it's so interesting because, and I've talked to a lot of canal players about it too. Be, um, and I think everybody is conscious that, okay, when I'm in the flow state, like I'm doing my best work, but of course, everybody wants to know how to tap into it on command, right? Like everybody wants to wish they could just do it and go there. And that's just not how it works. <laughs> but yeah, like, I wish I, I could like to ask. <laughs> I always like yeah. to ask people about, who are really skilled at the craft, like if, if how they have noticed that they've gotten into it most consistently over the years. So I think your insight is really, really helpful. I think the thing about music is so true. It really, that's really what does it for me too, honestly, most of the time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, I also tend to be a decently, like, musical person mm -hmm. in terms of just, like, I just love music. <laughs> so it's, like, it's something that really sets the tone. So, so yeah, for someone else, it may be something completely different. Totally. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I think maybe entering Flow State 2 is something to do with, like, a lack of expectations, I feel like. Like, maybe, have you entered Flow State really hardcore when you're focusing super, super hard on the competition or like super, super hard on a trick because I mean, I know it has happened for me, but I feel like I've done my best play when I'm not, when I'm not playing there's no end goal in sight. There's no expect, I'm not playing with any like expectations on me and I just start playing Kendama and that's when I just have done my hardest tricks. And honestly, when I look back at my life hmm. and I've taken things like, I guess, quote unquote, less seriously and, but still have done them. I, that's when I've had some of my best performances and like any skills that I've been doing. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, yeah. In a way, in a way, yes. Um, well, I've also found like for myself, I'm also can be decently good under pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like it's like, oh shoot, I put some pressure on myself, but also it's the pressure to relax to relax a little bit. Yeah. You know, because I'm like, I know, I know my I know myself that I'm like, okay. I just got to keep breathing. Like sometimes in competitions, I just got to take extra breaths, just mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, do like, sometimes I just think like, I'm just in my practice space. Even if I'm in front of a ton of people, I'm like, let me just feel like I'm, I've been feeling in my practice space, yeah. you know, like, like that's, that's all I need to see right now. You know, like that's all. And it's like, I, I know I can do this, you know, and it's just kind of like thinking that way. So it's like, I, I am extremely focused at the time, but then I also know I can, um, you know, I can perform because I've practiced, you know? Um, right. Yeah. So yeah, definitely not a ton of pressure or like definitely a ton of pressure, but also definitely um, a pressure to, engage you know the the flow in a way the flow state or engage just staying calm yeah and, and tr like the mental process that keeps me calm during competition should be engaged now kind of the thing <laughs> you yeah. know that's kind of the that's kind of the thought process i think about often yeah. so totally so, yeah. yeah no i'm saying i mean nick and i've had our definitely fair share of experience with that so it's cool to hear how our experiences correlate with yours and like uh, yeah. you know, the similarities, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Or how does it, 
Oh, yeah. uh, I, I, I want to ask, how does it feel like going to the Kendama World Cup and like that kind of level, you know, with so many, so many competitors that are raised since they're kids doing Kendama, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, how, like, how does that feel? Or like, how do you prepare? I'd, I'd love to know that. If, mm -hmm. if, yeah. Nick, you can yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the Kanama World Championships is probably the best event to go to if you're playing, if you're a Kanama player. And yeah, you're exactly right. In Japan, people are doing it from a lot younger age, literally since they're elementary school kids. And then they end up, if they take it really far towards this style of play, they end up qualifying for finals relatively fast. You know, the best competitors in the world right now are kids. They're all in grade school. And uh, yeah, they're really setting the bar for everybody who's, who's playing currently. Um, for, for practice, for me, uh, having, having won it once before, I'll just go off that year when I was, I guess that's, that's probably when I practiced the most ever for it. Um, I would, back then I was, you know, I also like to think I really thrive off of uh, high pressure stakes and I'm, I'm, I tend to be good at those and nerves usually help me in these situations. Um, but definitely at least practicing playing Kanama for, you know, two hours a day practicing for at least one, one and a half to two. You know, I mean, these are my lowest days. These are just like bare minimum stuff going into the competition. You practice for three to four months uh, leading up to it. But, you know, obviously everybody has different practice routines, but once, once I'm up there, um, I always think, and this is, I, let me know if you feel the same way or if there's a situation for you in juggling, but I think I am always the coldest, and this sounds obvious, but I'm never my I'm never my full best on like the first day or in the first match. For example, like KDBC or Kanama World Cup has uh, two days: it's prelims and finals. And prelim days, of course, you you know try to qualify for finals. And I noticed that my playability, no matter you know how much I've done this routine, no matter how much I've practiced, it's never quite as good until. Like the farther I make it in composition, I get better and better and better. So I've noticed that in recent years and for Kanama World Championships, I've I've always been able to to land all my tricks in my preliminaries, but I've always felt, hmm, that felt a little bit off or something wasn't, you know, as I expected there. But then when I get on the big stage in the finals, I'm usually a lot more composed. And maybe I just really love being in front of everybody. Um, I think I'm just used to it at that point. I know the first the first year I didn't practice final run. The first year I went because the only goal was to get to the final day. So once I did that, I was like, all right, whatever happens, happens. Um, but once I get there, you know, ever since ever since I started practicing final, I just realized I'm always able to perform best on a big stage. And I've noticed that, uh, you know, I noticed my, myself hit flow state a lot on big stages, you know, at, at national world, world competitions. Uh, it's happened this year in Europe, um, for European Kanawa championships. I had one match in particular, uh, playing the current best player in the world in the semifinals. And it was definitely one of the best, well, like one-to-one, -one, one -on one-on-one open matches in my entire life. Um, yeah. so yeah, you, I tend to hit those. I think, I think, yeah, the practice, but I think I'm only able to hit flow state and perform in these situations. If I trust and it goes back to what you said, you know, trusting your own practice. You know, I, people always ask, people ask me a lot too, like, how are you able to perform and deal with your nerves and perform under pressure? And one thing, of course, is experience, getting used to going out there and being in front of people and doing hard things like that. But another thing, you know, that that's a part of it that we can't deny, it, but another part of it is, for me at least, is relying on just knowing you've done the work necessary, knowing that you put in the work that, you know, for you, for your schedule, uh, you know, the time allotted for you, that was, you know, ample enough time. You didn't really slack off many days. You, you know, you played every single day, gave it your best and then trusting that going into the competition. So I think that's how I'm able to overcome a lot of nerves and actually just use it to my advantage. So it, I, I was really, really excited when you said that because it just really resonated a lot with me, especially when I'm yeah. practicing these bigger ones. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's interesting because I've, I've competed against like people who, I would argue are be like are better jugglers than me uh, like and but they have never done like a sport juggling competition they're like incredible performers they're incredible like uh, just jugglers but like getting to know the nerves going in like 
sometimes you need the experience of competing yes like several times to like anticipate the amount of nerves that creates because it's a different kind of nerves than like performing uh mm -hmm. yeah yeah like definitely yeah right right yeah. i feel like i feel the opposite for performance there's not really too many like just performance you know competitions yet there's freestyle of course but i think i think in i think juggling is just a little different in that regard there's a probably a lot of more things that you have to nail maybe with the music and use the audience and you know there's probably a lot more uh, factors uh i feel like i'm i'm a lot more comfortable under super competitive situations where it's you know set tricks you have to do it like this this or else it's not good and whatnot where it comes to freestyle i've noticed i think i perform a little worse just overall based on my records um yeah so it's kind of interesting um I would like to see, now that you talk about performance, I'd love to see, I mean, there is a competition coming next year, but yeah, more performance things for Konami because there's people who are really, really just absolutely incredible at it. So yeah, they'd be good to, to kind of use yeah. the reference. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you, Zach, how do you prepare for competition? Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's if, for the world championships in particular, I mean, it's just always a lot of, um, it's just a lot of just drilling. I mean, I'll talk. I'll talk about just the, this this year in particular. This year, Nick and I were practicing together for the World Championships for our preparation this year. Um, so, and it always feels. I feel like it's it's nice. It's definitely not necessary, but it's also it's kind of nice to have someone be in the be in the zone, like be in the fight with you, you know, and and be able to practice with somebody because you can push each other. Because I mean, there are definitely some times where I wasn't feeling to practice, but Nick were Nick was wanting uh, like we we got to do this, and they're like, yeah, okay, we're we're competing at the World Championships, like it's not like we're trying to compete just for fun. We're, we're trying to do our best, you know. So nice. I don't like to yeah. enter any competition where I'm not trying to do my best. Um, so yeah, so it's really nice to do that. And so how it looked like this year was Nick and I had some other stuff and other focuses that we were that we were focusing on, and um, so it's not like we were playing all day Kanama like we had been able to in the previous years, especially the years when we were in high school, um, high school summer. I mean, I mean, we're doing nothing but playing Kanama, like literally nothing. Nice. So we had a lot, we were preparing a lot, but this year it was a little more stuff on our plate, but always made sure to go to, it felt like a literal, like it felt like a literal sports practice in terms of the, the type of how required it was in our minds. I mean, we felt like it was completely mandatory because we were trying to do our best and, on top of juggling everything. So we would literally go to a laundromat in Japan and Japan is so humid in the summer and we're in there the summer and like practicing outside is literally like a, a recipe for making you super frustrated because you're nothing's going to go the way you want, like at nothing and, yeah. and it only get it, get harder to play because it's so wet. So Nick and I would go find an air conditioned laundromat and we're like, all right, time to practice, time to dial in. And we would just drill our runs for like an hour and a half uh every single like for probably a month until the competition and and it was it was pretty intense i mean it gets intense and it definitely gets uh monotonous at times because like i'm doing the same thing over and over and over but but after so many years of competing and 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 practicing you and having achievement in competition this is the stuff that really gives you that confidence gives me that confidence and I, it's a, it's the foundation that i can like you said like rely on because i know i've done the work i know i've done this much work i i know i've done this much practice i know i've seen my improvement and whatever happens happens but I, at least i know I've, I've done this much work to prepare me for this type of competition and i've always said like not no amount of practice guarantees any result it just guarantees i think the amount of uh confidence i think a person has because it's impossible it's almost impossible to not be confident or at least used to uh, something if you've done it a like a, a thousand times so i nick right. and i would literally just how the world cup works is that in short it's basically like you've you use a three minute timer and there's like three different runs you can do there's two runs in the first day that anybody can enter but if you make them the final day that's another three minute timer and you have to do tricks too so nick and i would just be doing three minute timers over and over and over again for a minute or like an hour and a half just drilling our the oh. same things that are plans like over and over until an hour and a half is done and then if we will feel like doing more we do more but uh it's it gets it's it was repetitive yeah. but that's really what it kind of takes honestly yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 it's just like consistency yeah because yeah. you just gotta get that muscle memory in the body you know you just yeah. gotta yeah <laughs> make it automatic to the point you don't think about it like yeah. sometimes yeah exactly yeah exactly getting that comfortable yeah. level up to where even on your worst day you can you're confident like i can get this done
which is really yeah. tough. It takes a lot of time. I don't think a lot of people realize that, but I think it, it does take a lot of time to get that. It takes a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 For, yeah. I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was, no, please. I'm about to turn. This oh, into, yeah. Yeah. I like, I consider, I feel like, I don't know if this is offensive to say, but like, I, I feel like Kendama is kind of a type of juggling as well. Cause like, mm -hmm. there's so many like tricks and like variations you can do. Uh, and like, yeah. And there's also so many things that could go wrong. Like the string can tangle or like all kinds of random things. So it just takes like repetition. Uh, oh. And like, yeah, for example, like the juggle to spike is like, for me, super hard. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I would like try to do like over and over just to get the feeling down. And yeah. it's like, yeah, I feel like juggling is very similar in that regard. That's mm -hmm. just consistency. Yeah. hundred yeah. percent similar. hundred percent similar. Yeah. Definitely not a, no, I mean, Kanama, a form of juggling for sure. I mean, a huge, a huge stable part of Kanama in today's game is definitely juggling the Kanama itself. My qu oh, quick question to you is, was juggling the Kanama actually hard for you to pick up or is it like pretty easy for you? Uh, the juggle is yeah, it was actually pretty easy for me. Okay. Like honestly, like I learned it. I mean, like the the weird part for me was the string. Yeah, right. that was like that was the hard part to get that like, it, like I would throw it high and it would just go like, like yeah. right, like. Uh, so it's like definitely something to get used to. But yeah, I realized for kendama players, like it was way harder. Um, the juggle is considered like a harder trick. Mm -hmm. but like but yeah but obviously like for me it was like it was kind of what i usually do but with the string <laughs> yeah so so yeah. but then juggled the spike is like that that okay. i was like it took me a long time to like have the whole control mm -hmm. or like what yeah. yeah yeah i was like that's like that's a separate skill <laughs> right there so yeah. Oh yeah no it, there's some crossovers between juggling and kendama for sure and it's i mean it's huge it's it's which is really, really cool. There's a lot of juggling tricks in Kendama. For, yeah. for, I want to talk about motivation because I think, you know, it's rare to meet somebody who's been doing anything for 15 years straight, like anything. And Nick and I have been playing Kendama for 12 and a half years. Um, there are not that many Kendama players out there who've been playing for 15 years. That's still actually play. You know, like they've definitely started, there's been some people who started over 15 years ago for sure, but they don't actually play actively anymore. So, there's a lot of players listening right now that are in between one and, and five years in, in their Kanama journeys. Uh, and, you know, maybe they've absolutely loved Kanama and have had no obstacles or lulls yet in their journey. Uh, but if that's the case, which it might not be for some people, uh, there's going to be some eventually. because It's not all sunshine and rainbows to the journey um, for always yeah. for any skill. And I've actually seen players quit at the first sign of first struggle or first obstacle where they can't play as frequently as they like to or et cetera. So I was wondering if you could walk us through how you've been motivated across the year and how your motivation, I'm sure, has changed and evolved from when you have, were starting to play when you were eight to like the middle of your career uh, to now. How has your motivation changed throughout the years and what has been the main motivators for you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember when I was like, when I was a kid, uh, hearing about jugglers like quitting after being like incredible incredible jugglers and they're like they don't juggle anymore and i was like super like super sad about it um because i was like uh, they just got a job and now they can't juggle as much you know like yeah but um <laughs> so but but yeah but now i'm like oh it, you know we all take our own journeys to, um yeah like for me what, what really keeps me juggling is well, I guess one, the, the amount of possibilities that juggling has, you know, like it's just infinite, like the amount of tricks you can go for and just like creatively what you can make. Um, but for me, um, I like for me, it's become like a key part of just who I am, you know, like it's something that's mine, you know, I don't do it because other people do it. I do it because it's just, you know, it's my um you know it's been my like ther therapy at times you know sometimes i'm frustrated about something go to a practice i feel so much more like fulfilled than just um you know it's it's something that's always been there for me you know that's how i how i feel with juggling so like for me it's like a vitally important 
thing that I feel like is it gives me purpose in, in some way. So that's why like it, it just motivates me in that way that I'm doing, you know, I'm I'm doing juggling and uh just like going at it wholeheartedly and like it's something I've like built, you know. It it's right. like when you look at like a table that you build or something or like like you're like wow the amount of process I remember going through all that process and wow it's come this this far you know um yeah I, I I've definitely like so that that's like my main motivation I'd say mm -hmm. and um I've definitely uh had some days where I'm like it's hard it's hard when you reach a certain level but then your level kind of goes down just from being busy and being uh, being you know whatever mm -hmm. um that it's hard when your level goes goes down a little bit and your practice is like sucks like you're just dropping everything and like it's hard to you know some some days those are frustrating and like one thing i i remind myself is um you know i always expect to do my best in every practice but sometimes you don't do your best, you know, it's just part of the process and it's part of the, uh, you know, the journey. Like, why does every practice have to be the best? Do what you can. Like, that's why sometimes I do mental goals, you know, like, it's like, I can accomplish something I can do, you know, right. um, and it's like, okay, let me set a trick that is at the level I can do today, you know and let me hit that trick you know yeah. um right. yeah and it's like you know and in a way it's like learning to give yourself grace uh because i feel like for me over the years i've put a lot of pressure on myself just for competitive reasons and for you know just like you know i see someone else hit a trick and i really want to hit that trick or i i really want to make sure i'm working hard enough to keep matching his level but but i'm like i i started to think about juggling and in, uh, in a way that um you know i'm doing like it's it's a part of me and like the juggling i do doesn't have to be someone else's and mm. um yeah yeah in in a way what motivates me it's it's a big part big part of myself and and um you know not every day is perfect and you know just just focus you know, on um, something you could accomplish that day and just do that, <laughs> you know, and just keep, because one day could be really bad, but the next day could be better. Or, you know, sometimes you just need rest. Uh, like one thing I realized is I do a two or three hour session. Then the next day I don't practice. And then I come back. Like that's kind of my routine yeah. because it's like, it, cause sometimes if I practice the next day, I'm still tired from the previous day. And, yeah. and, and it's like, but then like your brain keeps working though. Your brain keeps thinking about the tricks unconsciously mm -hmm. in some way. Um, so, and sometimes you're trying to trick for so long that you'd like get worse at the trick, but yeah. you, you get to know the trick along the process. So you're like, you're like, okay, your, your muscle memory is working, but you're just exhausted. But then when you're fresh, the trick somehow just works and it, it's like no I, I feel like no um no pain is wasted like no um hmm. uh no you're still working on the trick even if you're not getting the trick if right. that makes sense yeah uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah like no effort no conscious efforts like wasted even if you're taking if it's consciously you're constantly resting it's still giving you still preparing you to do the trick later on yeah 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 I, exactly yeah i think that uh yeah what you mentioned about your practice sessions um i think it was really cool to dive into for a, for a second or two because you did mention that you know you do have three you, three to four hard sessions per week in your in, in your documentary and you and you said people ask you do you practice every day and you're like actually i actually don't um and you know you do a hard practice session every day or one day and then yeah you said you rest I think I think for most people this might be surprising because um, I think overall frequency uh, and in my mind too I, I would say 
obviously depending on how physically demanding one's uh, skill is, right? Um, but I would say like that the amount of frequency usually correlates to a higher like higher skill level. Like just the the higher frequency of play um, can make a person better over time. But you know what's worked best for you that you found is hard, go, dividing a week up into hard sessions and then actively resting. Um, I think it's really interesting. And you said the three hour, like when you do a hard session, you, it's about like three hours. Yeah, two to three hours. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so, and, and can, can you give us a little, like, does it, is it, is that how you're doing it right now too? Is like, like still consistent in your life with what you've got going on? Yeah. Um, so I would say no, because my, my life has changed a little bit in terms Yeah. of schedule and touring. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Like when I'm home and when I like I'm off tour um, or like sometimes when I'm on tour, like uh, I would do a two to three hour session or like two hour, hour and a half to two hours kind of. It started being an hour and a half to two hours because I would like juggle during a show and like every day. Um, so ideally like that that is kind of like what works uh, but then there's warm-up time with like before the show <laughs> so um so but then i also have struggled to stay consistent with just the traveling um in terms of like consistently doing a two-hour practice in an indoor spot <laughs> you know that's uh because it was an outdoor show so i would do um Yeah, I would honestly do like an hour, like every day. Like Mm -hmm. there are obviously those days where like we had done so many shows that I'm like, okay, like I'll warm up a little bit, but like, Yeah. but I would do like an hour before the show uh, and warm up the juggling and then get dressed and do the show. You know, Yeah. that, that set me for success, like I would say, um, Yeah, but then I'm also in a in a state like with performing juggling. Sometimes you juggle more, but not you don't push as much. You know, Right. you like sure your, your tricks are consistent for the stage, but you're not pushing for harder tricks. Um, so now that I'm back home, like yesterday, I came back and, and like I practiced the tricks I usually perform, but then I pushed as well. So I haven't pushed as much. in the past five months as much Mm -hmm. like i've had some really good sessions here and there that i have pushed but like on average uh, the schedule has changed in, in a decent amount just to focus on performing and like making sure i'm warmed up for the show properly um so so yeah so since the documentary things have changed a little bit uh but i'm like coming back to it uh like at the moment and Yeah. Yeah, I have this other gig that I may be doing in Seattle uh, starting in November. So Oh. so there I'm going to try to establish a routine because it'll be a little more chill than traveling so much. So, so uh, yeah, that's kind of like, yeah, my schedule has changed and it's like kind of inconsistent, but trying to, you know, build back a routine in some way. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, How long so yeah. are you in Seattle doing those uh, performances, those routines? Um, it'll be, yeah, it'll be till March 30th. It's going to be the last show. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Is it like Yeah. weekly? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's going to be like five times a week, like Wednesday through Sunday, usually. Really? Yeah. Oh. Oh, Zach and I are actually going back <laughs> in December. We're from Uh, Seattle. oh, shoot. We're Yeah. from Seattle, yeah. So we're going to go That's there. for. I'll be there for a month, and Zach will be there for a week. I would love to go see one of your shows. Yeah, I know where I'm going. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'm like, like, this is a recorded podcast. I'm, I'm still like working on the process of you know, like being, in, being in contact with them and like, Yeah. like they, they want me for the show, but no contracts been signed, <laughs> Yeah. but Oh, it's probably going to happen. So uh, yeah. I don't know how much I can like disclose about like the show. Cause uh, it'd be kind of funny if the show comes out and, <laughs> and Yeah. I happen to be there. Um, But yeah, yeah, definitely let me know. And I'd love to meet up with you guys too. And That yeah, is just hang out. awesome. Sounds sweet. That would be Yeah, awesome. let's Um, go.
yeah that'd be, that'd be so sick okay cool well yeah nice that's something to, that's really that's something to look forward to uh at the end yeah so i think that's yeah. that's great what's uh i mean this is kind of going into the next question but yeah spencer we've talked about a lot today and i was wondering what's what's next for you what's coming up into the start of 2025 is it is it mainly the seattle thing or do, do you have anything great like big plan next year for your travels or com competitions or anything um yeah so far it's um yeah so far it's the seattle thing i have a few get like opportunities i'm looking at um yeah. for later in the year but yeah definitely some more shows and circuses and stuff so um but yeah nothing um yeah nothing concrete yet basically so mm -hmm. so yeah just okay so yeah yeah Cool though. Even the Seattle thing is still in the works. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds like it could be yeah. a really awesome opportunity, though. I, mean, I hope the, I hope it happens because I mean that's a long time in Seattle. And I think it's yeah. I'd love to see you there. Yeah, I love the yeah. yeah, yeah. I love I love Seattle. Like I have some really good friends there, and like yeah, I spent I spent a good portion of the time there, like two weeks there earlier this year. Nice. Uh, have you guys ever been to the Moisture Festival? No, the, never. What is that? <laughs> it's called the moisture festival because it's seattle and it's in the spring but um but basically it was a variety show it's like one of the longest running variety shows in the world that it takes place in seattle and they have so many like artists it takes place over like for over a month wow uh, so, so i i managed to perform there earlier this year uh wow. like it was during march yeah it was during march uh march and april yeah um yeah mm -hmm. so definitely uh yeah it'll probably happen this year as well but yeah that's a really fun festival that's like seattle based and has like so many random variety show circus performers so so yeah wow. <laughs> yeah yeah nice. yeah but yeah i was there earlier this year i i, I was meaning to say so and it was awesome yeah hmm. but yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just found you on the site. So that's epic. Nice. Okay, I'm cool. getting hyped for the winter now. <laughs> for as we wrap up here, I, oh, yeah. I want to ask you what you would like to be. How would you like to be remembered in the juggling community when it's all when it's all said and done? What what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? Yeah, definitely someone who pushed juggling. You know, in a way, I want to have a memorable style, and I I want to also accomplish some things in the performing world. Like just, uh, mm. just have a, like you know, like I'm, a, I'm kind of a more traditional juggler in terms of like difficult juggling, but I also want to have it like have my own spin on it that like, you know, doesn't have, just like, isn't just like everyone, like everyone else in the super traditional, uh, sphere mm. of of performing, um, yeah. I also just want to, you know, be a you know, like a, a decent resource. I've, you know, I've, I've, uh, I'm kind of working on perhaps creating some more like YouTube videos. And I just like, I, I want to just impact the community and make jugglers, you know, just keep advancing and just yeah. impact the next generation of jugglers. Cause I just know, like, I just know that eventually I'll stop, uh, you know, pushing as hard my juggling because it's just, you know, just what happens but i like i want to just continue the you know impact on the next generation that other jugglers that i looked up to like did to me you know i would watch videos all day of juggling of all these jugglers doing insane things which really motivated me to push and do some crazy stuff too so it's like i want to just keep that going and you know make juggling you know keep keep progressing as an art form and as a sport so so yeah yeah <laughs> beautiful yeah i mean it's just it's just like you said you know i think i think you're transitioning you're not obviously not done competing or anything like that but you you definitely recognize that there's more roles to play not only just for yourself but for the future of juggling um as a sport so i think it's really cool yeah. that you're you're you know going to four, you're going to be adopting a position like that, trying to stay involved with the community as much as possible and just offering what you can provide, what's most valuable to the, you know, the juggling community, like that only you can provide. So 
I think that's that's amazing. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. No, yeah. And I think it's cool, like, um, yeah. It's like we all get to a point where we've done, like, enough – or not enough, but like we've done a lot of our discipline and it's like, okay, how can we see these kids like super duper motivated and it's like, yeah. how can, how can we like, you know, transfer, you know, what, what you've learned in some way to them. Cause I, I'm like, gosh, I want to see someone do like, I don't know, nine club back crosses. I don't even know what's yeah. going to happen. Uh, and, uh, and and be like, wow, I paved the path for stuff like that to happen, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds like we're on similar journeys with that in our respective disciplines. So I think yeah. that was really cool. Man, yeah. That's awesome fun. to hear where your head's at because I think it's, I mean, as you said earlier, there are some of your favorite jugglers were super good at juggling. Then they just stopped posting tricks, juggling, and being involved in the community. But it sounds like where your head's at, it's like you want to still leave an impact in, in a way that only you can by, you know, blessing other jugglers and continuing your knowledge and what you learn and what you continue to learn. So, and by, and by doing that, continuing to have a positive impact on the juggling community, which I think is beautiful, dude. So, uh, Nick and yeah. I definitely wish you the best of luck in that. And I think Thank that's you. an amazing, amazing path that you can, that you're taking. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. Likewise. Yeah. No, keep posting crazy stuff. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Well, Spencer, I think that's going to wrap it up for today, but Hey, thank you so much again for joining us. That was an amazing conversation. I really had a great time talking to you and getting to know you better. And, uh, I just cannot wait to, you know, see you in December if that all works out. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you guys as well. No, truly an honor. And, uh, yeah, let's definitely hang out in the future somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Sounds good. Well, have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Likewise. Take care. Thanks, Spencer. See ya. Yeah. See ya. Yeah.